Welcome to Coffee House. Our society is of a different character. <laughs> And we may have one particular man to thank for it. Edward Bernays wanted to rehabilitate the idea of propaganda as a tool for an elite minority to manipulate masses and use things like applied psychology and symbols. However, this book that we are reading today, Propaganda by Edward Bernays, was published in 1928. This is just after, in the midst of the Bolshevik Revolution and just before the apocalyptic dictators of the 20th century. And this book is Dystopian Nightmare Fuel. So, as always, we will go through the contents of the book with a little bit of editorializing peppered through. Then we'll go through an analysis and then talk some big picture stuff. So these are the contents of Propaganda by Edward Bernays. We start with a preface where another writer, I can't remember the name, talks about the origin of propaganda and how it wasn't until about 1915 until government started using media widely to manipulate the inclinations and disinclinations of its populace. Bernays specifically had the idea of trying to rehabilitate or redeem the word propaganda because it had a negative bend at the time. Of course, he didn't do that especially well, but we have a bunch of propagandistic terms that we use that are euphemisms for the kinds of things that he advocated. But the idea was to have a benign elite of rational manipulators. He believed that people were not smart enough to govern themselves and they needed these elites. And one kind of framing of this that I thought was useful was that this author talks about how if you're trying to sell a piano, you don't just try to sell a piano, you sell the piano room first. Say that everybody needs to have a piano room, and then you can get them to get the piano. So then we go into the actual book, chapter one, where it sets the stage of that it's a small group of specific people who pull the strings, and organizations that pull the strings, as opposed to the people themselves. In chapter two, I think there's a reference to Louis XIV, the l'Estat moi, the, I don't know if I said that right, I am the state. <laughs> but the point is that propaganda is the invisible arm of the government. And it only depends on what it's being used for. Of course, Bernays specifically says that it's used for good, and the good being the ideological purposes that he's trying to effectuate. But modern propaganda is a consistent, enduring effort to create or shape events to influence the relations of the public to an enterprise, idea, or group. So it's a deliberate, consistent effort that is trying to create and shape events to be able to influence the public. But the important thing is that it is universal and continuous. So one thing that he points out is that millions of individual housewives might feel that certain foods are bad, that they're deleterious to the health of their families, so they should be banned. But if they don't band together, if they don't create an organization or use propaganda to effectuate this, then it's, it's not going to happen. It doesn't matter how many millions of them believe this certain thing. And he emphasizes again that it's an intelligent minority that must use propaganda continuously and systematically to change how people think and what they want or what they think they want. So chapter 3 goes into some discussion about this uh, cabal of specials who get to decide what is best for the rest of us uh, and how the president is somebody who's drafted by a dozen men around a table, not voted on by millions of people in an election, and that people don't know the extent to which they are manipulated. They think it's a personal choice, they believe it's a personal choice, but it absolutely is not. And we get this organized power on public opinion that is burgeoning at this time that he's advocating. And he uses this term, the Public Relations Council. He said that we need a Public Relations Council to determine how to do this and which way it should be going. Then chapter 4, he talks about the psychology of public relations, goes a little deeper into what it is, and how it's manipulating the impulses, habits, and emotions of people, and that people think they're making a choice, but they're not. And they use things like cliches and naming, and this was something that kind of jumped out to me, because he'll bring up specific things like using cliches, using particular naming, and using particular symbols, and those are ways that you're able to manipulate the way that people think to get them to align with your goals, your gains that you want to make. So the And this is another thing that he emphasizes multiple times, is that Public Relations Council must determine if the interests coincide between the public and the council. And if they don't, then they need to manipulate the public into getting in line. Chapter 5 talks about business and the public, so it goes on advertisement. Of course, this was a very new thing in the Mad Men era. It's something that had been done before, but it's something that now was being done systematically. So instead of reply to demand, you create demand. 
Instead of look for your customers, you make customers and you have your fingers constantly on the pulse. Obviously, with the media companies, the multimedia companies, the trillion dollar companies that we're dealing with now, this is what they do all the time. And it's done in such a way that isn't just they hire ad men who try to figure out what people like or try to suggest that people should like particular things. They have troves and troves of data. They have AI working on this 24 7 and it's a whole different ball game. Chapter 6 talks about propaganda and and political leadership. So, of course, this is another step and a more concerning step. But you have the prejudices and the symbols and the cliches that are implanted by the political leaders. And he suggests that the political leaders determine an objective of the campaign and they use scientific analysis of the public to effectuate that campaign objective. You have to educate emotions, and you have to realize that most people are mostly uninterested in politics. And I think this is the big thing that I've had to learn recently, is that most people are just not that interested in politics. So what they do is they find some shortcuts that make it the easiest way for them to digest the political reality. And so you have to deal in that space. If everybody had all the same information, it'd be a different story. And you could just argue on that basis. You know, you could have more objective, clean arguments. But the fact that you don't, it creates an incredible landscape that is susceptible to this kind of manipulation. And it's important, he points out, that it's not really about the liberals versus the conservatives. You have these overlapping groups with interests, and that's how they have to be treated. Different groups group in different ways, and it's based on different factors, and they have to be addressed in those ways. And of course now, I mean, it's just axiomatic to talk about how special interest groups lobby government forces to try to get their interests protected. And there's a recommendation that we should create a secretary of public relations that specifically analyzes public thought and trends. And of course, I mean, this is huge business now, whether it's a corporation or whether it's the government in general, this polling Rasmussen or whoever else, uh, that is absolutely something that we do now, something that we've created. And remember, this guy is talking in 1928, okay? (laughs) Then we have this idea again of the intelligent minority that guides the masses because the masses are simply too stupid to do it themselves. Then we go into chapter 7, women's activities and propaganda. This was, of course, just after women's suffrage was passed, you know, not long before this. And he extols the virtues of the women's use of propaganda and how organized and armed they are with it. Then chapter 8 talks about propaganda for education, which is the scariest category to me. You can educate as a teacher and you can educate as a propagandist. And he specifically says that teachers have the right to carry on a definite propaganda. It's just, there's no way that this idea wasn't the thing that snaked its way all the way through for the last several decades to get us to the education systems that we have now. Then chapter 9 talks about propaganda and social service, and chapter 10 talks about propaganda in art and science, and I'm not going to go into too much detail in either one of those, but in art and science specifically, it was about capitalizing public values, you know, what people thought was beautiful. Specifically, you need to determine what is and is not beautiful and then impart that to the masses. And he talked about museums establishing these committees that decide what is standard beauty when it comes to art and home and architecture and how movies just try to show what's in vogue. Of course, it was a very nascent art form at the time, but today that's absolutely what it seems like. It's the Hollywood follows trends, you know, they're years behind where everybody actually is. And so they just try to appeal to whatever's coming out now. And that's why you've got the trend that we have now, which is making some of the worst films in history. And he pretty much signs off by saying that propaganda will never die out. So to move into our analysis, um, this book goes into the category of terrifying and probably much more influential than anybody realized. Of course, this could have been inspired by the Bolshevik Revolution. This is something that happened ahead of time with Leninism and the way that Lenin was kind of a a different character when it came to totalitarian states. He just did it in a different way, and it likely influenced not just what happened in Russia thereafter all the way through the Soviet Union, but what happened in fascistic dictators all over the world, whether it's Franco or Hitler or who's the dude in Italy? I can't remember his name for some reason. Whoever uh, it was, they were likely significantly influenced by Leninism and the way that Lenin really kind of changed the character of totalitarianism. And this book could have arisen out of that to kind of codify it in an effective way, or it could have been just parallel to that in trying to understand how it works. So, Mussolini, Jesus, how do you forget that? It's ridiculous. 
It has everything in it that modern political campaigns and companies do to manage or outright force particular tendencies in their customers or constituents. It's more of a broad direction at the beginning of a number of new disciplines. Of course, this is just at the beginning of psychology and social science and advertising. All these things are very new at this point. So you can't really expect the book (laughs) if you want to criticize it for not having rigorous scientific studies about all this stuff, you know, whether it's true or not that these things work. You can't really expect them to have encyclopedic scientific analyses at this point because the science was an infant. So (laughs) from that perspective, I think it really has very effective arguments and I can't find a whole lot of faults with them from the place that it's sitting. It just has very little interest in the evil that can be done with these methods. I mean, obviously, if you have just a cabal of a handful of people who are deciding all these things and you get bad people on that cabal just one time, then a whole bunch of very bad things can happen. And that seems to be the case right now. Of course, the degree to which this is just centralized in one group somewhere of a bunch of people who are deciding everything for us We don't know and we can't know, and that's something that would need to be empirically verified and evaluated. But I think, I mean, so much makes sense about what has was said in this book and what's going on in our culture today. And obviously, there's not even any denying that corporations, businesses, all those sorts of things absolutely do everything they can to try to manipulate people and use psychology and social science and data analyses to try to make that happen. There's no denying that. So moving on to big picture stuff. 2020 was kind of the tipping point year for propaganda. (laughs) It's the first time where we had a merger of trillion dollar companies with a political party and a completely compliant news media that was absolutely willing to push every one of these propagandistic points. Usually you have detractors within these news organizations who are not going to go along with this. You know, even if you have a couple of editors who are kind of pushing one way or pushing another way, then you'll have reporters in these that will publish opinions that fight against it. And they'll, they'll, be allowed to do that because there was a more important journalistic ethic that overwhelmed any of this other stuff. But right now, no, they're simply propagandistic arms. And I see it every single day when you see the headlines, the kinds of things they decide that they want to cover and not cover. It's pure propaganda now. That's that's the only thing that they care about doing. They don't even care about journalistic integrity at this point. Obviously, there are people who do, who are out (laughs) doing other things. And I'm sure there are individual reporters at these legacy media companies who want to do real journalism and have a commitment to it and are trying to do everything that they can within the system without being outed and being fired and all that, if they haven't all been fired already. But this is what journalism is now. It completely lost its character and integrity, and it's just a propagandistic arm right now. And I don't know how long it's going to last. I don't think it can last much longer because a lot of these places are imploding because they don't have the readership or viewership anymore. We'll have to see. But that was the thing is that we laid this foundation of becoming dependent on Silicon Valley who built products. And it's not just Google and YouTube and Instagram and Facebook, all the ones that, well, you don't have to use social media if you don't want to. But it's our phones, too. That's the thing that I realized is that I'm completely plugged into the Apple ecosystem. And if I wanted to jump ship, it would take a lot. So if they wanted to prevent me from doing something or just ban some things that I I want to have access to, then I don't have much of a recourse on that basis. You know, I have to go find somebody else who's making phones and computers and and iPads and all that. So the one positive thing is that all of these principles can be used for good. Of course, so said Mephistopheles. I mean, it's just that that devil's wager that you say that, okay, there's this great power here. I can be the one to use it for good. <laughs> I'm Frodo, but I'm actually going to toss it into the Mount Mordor or whatever it's called. Uh, we have some sloppy primate brains, and we're just not particularly capable of doing all the things that need to be done for this kind of a world. Somebody's going to try to use them in bad, dangerous ways and the counter to that is trying to use them for positive ways but there's always that temptation once you have that power that you can just use it just slightly to your advantage at first and then dramatically to your advantage at the end so we'll we'll see how it goes 
this was propaganda. Edward Bernays. This is the this is the coffee house. And we'll have a discussion about this book coming up really soon. It's going to delve into some of these ideas, and then we're going to have another book. And I'll let you know what the next book is going to be when we do the discussion. So because I'm not sure which one it is yet. I was going through Modern Times, but it's so long, and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do that one. So as of yet, we'll definitely do it at some point. But I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get through it so that I can consistently get an an episode up when it needs to be up. So anyway, much appreciated. Thank you guys so much for anybody who's still listening. We're working some kinks out. We've got some uh, super awesome stuff coming up where we're going to change some formats. I know I keep saying that, but it is coming up and (laughs) there are going to be very interesting things we'll be able to do as it goes along. And hopefully I will see you on the next one. All right, bye. (laughs)